Howdy folks, welcome back to Doing Group. This is video seven of our complete kitchen remodel series. In this video, we'll cover priming, painting the ceiling, and installing cement board for tile. Installing some really nice retrofit recessed can light trim kits, as well as a special announcement. Please stay tuned to the end of the video. As you can see, the drywall is up, the drywall is finished, and I've started to paint on the primer on all of our fresh drywall. Now, for anybody that has completed a kitchen or bathroom remodel, you know that when you get to the drywall stage, it's pretty significant. It's um, maybe not quite halfway, but you can start seeing your project come together and you can definitely start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to continue painting on this primer today, another coat of primer tomorrow, and that'll be the same day we put down our dirt rock on the floor for our tile floor install. I'm using a Kills primer that's specifically designed for covering fresh drywall. I'm gonna put a minimum of two coats of primer on and that's in preparation for my minimum of two coats of top coat paint. I don't understand why, but a lot of people absolutely despise the part of painting called cutting in. And that's where you cut in your corners, you cut in where your ceiling meets the wall, and I believe you cut in around all of your outlets. So to cut in, I will get about three quarters of an inch of paint on the end of my brush. brush. Not, not terribly damp. I'm not certainly not dunking the entire brush into the paint can. And the first application will be just right down into the corner, just to work that paint into the corner. Now, of course, this is the first coat, so I'll have another coat of primer to ensure I get a good, even coat and I don't miss anything. Now, after the corner is cut in, I'll go back and I'll cut in on one side I'll feather that in because later when I roll I don't want to see any brush strokes. I'll go back on the other side, finish the cut in on this corner. Now I have seen people take shortcuts and just try and roll on the primer coat and what they end up doing is really loading up the roller and which ends up squeezing too much paint into the corner, which ends up in a drip that sometimes you just don't catch. And really that's a doggone shame to have dried dripping paint on fresh drywall because now you don't have a beautiful painted finish when you're done on your brand new fresh drywall. So, my advice to everyone out there is to take your time, cut in, do your paint job right. I take the time to cut in around all inside corners, and that includes the corner where the wall meets the ceiling, as well as all outside corners, switch boxes, and outlet boxes. And then I begin to roll on the first coat. And I like to use the old W technique to distribute the paint on the wall from the loaded roller. Now, as you can see, I started on the left side initially with a loaded roller and moved to the right. And then I load up the roller again, start on the right side this time and move to the left. That way I can very evenly distribute the paint and ensure that this one area that I'm currently working in has a good even distribution of paint with no lap marks. Now, a lot of folks will save money, save a tiny bit of time and not paint or prime where the cabinets are gonna go, either the base cabinets or the wall cabinets. Because I do believe that four or five coats of latex paint provides somewhat of a vapor barrier to prevent cold air from escaping the house in the summertime and cold air from entering the house in the wintertime. So I'm a big believer in sealing up the fresh drywall with primer and top coat just really finishes up the job nicely and you know you've done the job right when the cabinets are installed and the countertops and, and you're finishing up. And I'll continue to roll on my first coat of primer using the W technique. As you can see around that outlet, I've already cut in. And as I mentioned, I like to cut in around outlets 
and I like to cut in around outlets with the finish paint as well because that's where you're going to tend to have a lot of you know fingerprints and dirt build up so you want to have some superior scrubability there so I like to go a little bit heavy on the primer and top coats around all of the switch plates and outlets rolling on the ceiling paint with the exact same technique except a little bit of a switch up here I like to begin going in one direction and then finish out going in another direction. For example, moving back and forth initially and then switching to right and left. I believe that this allows me to get the best, most even distribution of paint on the ceiling. Again, going fairly light on all of my coats to avoid any lap marks or drips. Two coats of primer are complete on the walls and ceiling. Now I'm cutting in with the white ceiling paint. And I want to ensure that I've got a good coverage of paint in that intersection where the ceiling meets the wall. So yes, I'll paint down a couple of inches onto the wall with that white ceiling paint. Essentially, that'll be another primer coat. And once I get the ceiling painted, then I'll go back and cut in with my wall paint. Although I have to be much more careful on that step to have a nice crisp line where the walls meet the ceiling. As you can see, putting on the first coat of ceiling paint and I'm using the W technique as I showed you previously and moving back and forth and then switching it up and going left and right. I've mentioned it previously, but I wanna emphasize that on all of my coats of primer and top coat, I like to go a little bit light on each coat of paint. I'm gonna end up with four to five coats of paint on the wall. I'm gonna have good coverage, but what concerns me is rushing, going too fast and ending up with either lap marks from the roller or heavy drips from just paint that's put on the wall too heavily. I don't want to ruin the finish on this brand new drywall. So I like to take it a little bit slow and steady. And that way I'm absolutely sure that I'm going to end up with the best possible finish when I'm completed. I'm just about complete with coat number one on the ceiling. I'm gonna take a break for lunch, run over to the hardware store and pick up my cement board for the floor. Then I'm gonna put on coat number two and then begin to install the cement board. Uh, I wanna install the cement board before I do my final top coat of paint on the wall because I don't wanna risk scarring up that paint while putting the cement board in place. We are mixing up the thin set, which will be placed underneath the cement board. Now that's per the manufacturer's instructions to properly secure the cement board and provide the most stable substrate for our tile floor application. We mix up this thin set batch to a consistency of about pancake batter. It's a little bit looser than what I like for tile, but I think it's perfect at this consistency to spread with a quarter inch notch trowel, which is also in accordance with the cement board manufacturer's installation instruction. I always seem to get a lot of questions about how do you know which type and dimension of trowel to use? Again, I'm using a quarter inch notch trowel here, and that's per the manufacturer's instruction. It all depends on the type of tile or stone and the size of tile or stone because the type and size of stone dictates the type of thin set that you will use for your installation. When you determine which type of thin set is most appropriate for your installation, 
then simply read on the bag or box of the thin set and it will tell you that based on the tile or stone size that you want to install, which size notch trowel to use. As you can see, I'm actually taking my time to install this thin set. I'm trying to make nice, neat, even rows. And that's not just because I'm really particular about how this thin set will look underneath a piece of cement board that no one will ever see. But if you consider that a notched trowel is really a measuring device, then it makes more sense because it's the size of the notch that exactly measures out the right amount of thin set you need for your application. More on that in just a moment. And here we're putting in the first piece of cement board. It's one full piece, no cuts required. You wanna leave a little bit of room, about an eighth of an inch around all of the perimeter walls, as well as in between each piece of cement board. Now we're gonna secure the cement board using specially designed rock-on screws and installing them at eight inches on center and no closer than two inches to the edge of the cement board. Next, I'll measure to ensure that I have room for one more full piece of cement board, apply the thin set and place another uncut piece of cement board in position and secure it with the rock-on screws. And ready to place our third piece of cement board on the subfloor. I've already applied the thin set. That's just a matter of placing another full piece of cement board in place. Now, an important note here is that you'll notice that we're offsetting this piece of cement board. You never want there to be a four piece corner, meaning the formation of a cross or a plus mark, if you will. You always wanna offset your intersections to form a T. Now, I'm gonna move that into place, have a nice 1 8 inch gap between my boards, and we'll secure it with the rock-on screws. Now, a bit more about the application of the thin set. And as you can see here, taking my time to get nice, even, straight lines with the thin set. In days past on home improvement shows, you might have seen some tile setters that were whipping the trial around and making these real pretty semicircle formations with the, the trowel and the thin set. But if you look real closely, as the trowel moves through the thin set, there's a wave of thin set that is pushed up upon the layers above it. And that creates an excess of thin set and you're not using the trowel as it's designed to measure out the thin set for proper application and proper adhesion of whatever you're setting, whether it be cement board, stone, or tile. And now to cut my first piece of cement board for this project. Simply transferring the measurement onto the cement board and setting up for the cut. Now, I like to use a jigsaw with a masonry blade. Now, a lot of guys will use a carbide tip cutter where you just simply score the line, crack it, just like you would drywall. But I just like to use the, the jigsaw. It allows me a whole lot more control and I end up with a perfect cut every time. It takes a little longer, but I'm not in that much of a rush. Spread out my thin set. Place my cut cement board in place. But that's kind of a good example of why I don't like to put the final top coat of paint on the wall. If that had rubbed the wall on the way down, it could have scarred up the paint. And we'll secure it with the rock-on screws. And I want to point out that your rock-on screws need to be set just below the surface of your cement board. And that'll make more sense here in a moment as we complete our cement board install.
this is our last piece of cement board to install. Next up, to complete the cement board installation, we need to use our thin set to cover all of the screw heads and to fill all the eighth inch gaps to the sheets of cement. This is a pretty simple process using a six inch knife. You just apply the thin set work it into either the hole above the screw head or into the gap between the cement board. As you go through the process, you'll see a couple of screws that need to be reset as I just did there. But it's real important. You don't want those screws to have any possibility of coming in contact with your tile or stone that could crack it. Now, as you can see, there's nothing highly technical about this step in the process. You just want to ensure that all your screw head holes and all of the gaps between your cement board panels are completely filled. This is not terribly difficult for the screw holes, but you do want to make sure you take the time to ensure that the gap between the panels are completely filled. And so what I do is I'll overfill and then use my knife and make a, a nice smooth transition. And let me point out at this point that through this whole process, as you're filling the holes and putting down the tape, you want to make sure that you don't leave a large ridge of thin set on your cement board, because that'll make it really difficult to get your tiles level. The next step, as you see me doing here, is to apply the mesh tape over all of your joints. Now this is an alkali resistant mesh tape, specifically designed for this application. The alkali resistance allows this tape to withstand the chemicals that are found in the thin set, and therefore it won't break down like other types of mesh tape you might be able to find at your hardware store. Now this type of mesh tape is a self-adhesive tape. There's a small amount of adhesive on the uh, side of the tape that, that bonds to the cement board. I've seen a lot of reviews where people are frustrated that they just can't seem to get the tape to stick to the cement board. A lot of times that's just due to the dust that's left on the cement board following cutting and installation. So I found that it works really well to apply your thin set to the gap between your boards, get it nice and smooth, ensure that the gap is completely filled, and then apply your mesh tape and another skim coat of thin set over top of that while ensuring that you're not putting a huge mound of, of thin set over your, your, uh, your gap. And also, I found that if I am able to get the tape to adhere to the cement board prior to filling the gap, I kind of have a hard time ensuring that I've got good fillage, if you will, of that gap through all the little you know squares of the mesh tape so i'm a big proponent of fill your gap first and then apply your tape and once you have all of your screw heads and gaps filled you want to let that thin set set up overnight there's one more thing i want to do before i finish out this video and that's install some LED replacement lights. And let me tell you, these lights are beautiful and a real snap to install. It really could not be any easier. So these are commercial electric LED low glare recess trim lights in a soft white. They provide a tremendous amount of light. And as I said, they're super easy to install. This is about all there is to it. This pigtail or power cord screws into the existing light bulb receptacle. And then this orange plug plugs into an orange receptacle on the back of the light fixture. That's the only light bulb there is right there, that little LED, but it's super bright. And here's where the connection cord plugs into. Those tabs around the side provide tension and keep 
the recessed light up into the existing can. Now, as I mentioned, it could not be any easier than screwing in a light bulb. You screw in the cord and that pigtail sticks out. Then you take your light fixture, plug the orange plug into the orange receptacle. And you're almost done with a recessed can light installation. Super simple, really nice, a lot of light, and they were only about $25 a piece. Since Doom Brew began posting videos on YouTube, we've really been operating on a shoestring budget, but we really want to increase the production quality of our videos. New cameras, new sound recording, new editing capability, all of which will increase the production quality, but hopefully also the speed at which I can post videos. Now, since we launched last week, we have one brand new patron, Suzanne McCloskey. Thanks a lot for supporting the channel, Suzanne. It is greatly appreciated. And we want to increase the production quality of our videos for obvious reasons, but also this is the next project you're going to see on Doing Brew. The complete inside and out, top to bottom, renovation of this beautiful 1832 Greek Revival farmhouse. The entire house needs to be completely replumbed. The radiator system needs to be completely rebuilt. The original slate roof needs extensive repairs. Every bit of trim around every door, window, the baseboards in this nearly 7,000 square foot house needs to be stripped, primed, and repainted. There's even an old servant's quarters on this 200 year old property that's in significant distress. In fact, one of the walls is nearing collapse. This is by far the most challenging project we've ever undertaken. So I hope you'll subscribe to Doing Bruce so you don't miss any episodes of this exciting and interesting renovation. And hey, sure would appreciate you even considering becoming a patron of Doing Brew. Thanks a lot for watching this episode of Doing Brew, folks. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments or email me to the email address in the description. We'll see you back here next time on Doing Brew. Take care, folks.